by Friday, you've got to convince us you can test whether maybe is creative or not. <laughs> so, I expect the psychologists amongst you are thinking right on the scale of creativity. I'm in the control group, I'm going to get a measure, I'm going to do a T test, and I have alpha 0.05, and I'm going to prove that that's the case. I expect some of you are thinking that. Anyway, so um, I'm going to try and dissuade you from that. Last uh, April workshop, I talked to you about um, looking at data, letting the data speak for itself. Um, we kind of pushed off the idea of hypothesis testing. And so today, we could, we're going to confront this monster um, <coughs> through the labyrinth of probability. And, um, so Chris and me, we're going to do this together. This is totally unrehearsed, so I have no idea what's going to happen. Going to swap uh, at some point or other. See what we notice the change. Sorry. See what we notice the change. Yeah. 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 So, here we go. Straight in. Null hypothesis, significance testing. It's been a problem since 1933, I think it was, when it was first. Uh, formulated by some famous people you may not have heard of, or named and Pearson. And uh, many psychologists, many famous psychologists, have actually put their hands up in the air and said, this is absolute rubbish. And yet, everyone still does it. We all do our test 0.05, and if it's significant, we say our high Maybe you should explain what it is. Well, I don't know yet. We haven't got there yet. <laughs> we felt that, so we'll come to that in a minute. But those of you who know about well, hypothesis testing, about hypothesis testing, will be very familiar with that. And so, and, and we all get to exactly what it is in a minute, because that's not an easy question to ask. So, it's been known that this uh, idea that you test uh, two groups and that you see if they're significantly different uh, has been around for so long and criticised for so long. Um, and, and what we're going to say is not actually particularly new. But what makes a difference these days, I think, is that in the past, psychology and perhaps medicine uh, have kind of been, in, in, in a, been an in-house approach. But these days, uh, particularly with encompassing neuroscience, uh, who are advocates of Bayesian thinking, it's become, it's come to a head again I think this time the problem will not go away. And, uh, and you're very young and you still have lots of neuroplasticity, so I'm hoping that you will understand this problem and perhaps think of alternatives to this standard test. Um, so, but before we start, let me invite a bunch of Chris who's going to do an experiment just before we start. So, you, how many of you know what I mean when I say null hypothesis, alternative hypothesis? Anyone, does anyone not know what I mean? Okay, so, so let me just explain it. So, the idea is you do an experiment and you, you, have a hypo, you have a null hypothesis, which is that there is no effect, whatever you do, the control group and your treatment have no difference. Imagine there's two, two groups uh, looking at uh, effectiveness of a drug. If there's no difference, you, you fail to reject your null hypothesis. If you get an effect, you reject your null hypothesis. You say, hey, the drug works, let's go and help patients. That's the idea, general idea. <coughs> I don't want to say too much. So I'm going to pass over to Chris for a moment. Oh, yeah. I'll come back. Yes, I have. So actually, the following experiment is only for people who have experience with significance testing. So how many of you have actually used significance testing in their own research? So it makes sense because that's the majority. So what I would like you to do is actually take out your notebook or mobile phone and visit the following URL and answer the simple question which is presented on the URL. Okay? So that might take about five minutes or something like that. And we will come back to the question during the talk in order to discuss the results because it's quite illuminating. So 
I would like to ask you to do that right now. Thanks very much for your participation.
Anyway, so let's move on now. So, right. See, it's quite, um, it's quite a problem for human reasoning to deal with causality. And, and, and well, not so much with causality, but with uncertainty. So, typically, people do is try to explain things in terms of causality and human beings have been doing that for centuries and centuries. They usually end up fighting over each other and attribute it to, to some ultimate cause of God or something like that. And basically, um, and the problem is trying to find a reason for things in, in, in sequence in time. And so when uncertainty is found, it causes problems. And the uh, and it really wasn't until the Enlightenment period, uh, age of reason, call it the right, where people, this is people after Isaac Newton, who started thinking you can actually reason about probability. So there are things, there are probabilistic issues, um, which is quite a profound idea really, if you think about it. And the, the one that, the person who's um, probably most important in today's context is the reverend, not reverend, but the reverend. <laughs> <Thomas> <laughs> uh, so he's quite a religious man, ironically. Um, he came up with Bayes' theorem, or Bayes' rule, as we now know it. He didn't publish it, um, but his friend Richard Price published it after his death. I think in the hope that Bayes' rule would help him to prove the existence of God. Yet another irony uh, in itself. But, and that was. Um, taken up by Laplace, a famous mathematician, and the idea of, of probability was really uh, firmly established. Uh, and, and an axiomatic to, to, to that idea of probability is what's called conditional probability. Does anyone know what, does anyone know what I mean by conditional probability? Anyone does not know what I mean, be honest. Right. I'm going to explain to you. Now, you may know all this, we may have forgotten it all, but let's, uh, what I want to do is just take you through step by step to show you exactly how it works. So this is a, a refresher. So we have the idea of two events, A and B. And what I want to do is have the probability, the final probability of A occurring and B occurring. And basically the idea is, it, 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 you can write it as a conditional, where this little sort of vertical line means given that, in case you don't know. And, now, and so the probability of A and B is given by the probability of A, given that B has occurred, times the probability that B has occurred. Right? Don't lose, don't lose it, go with it, right? <laughs> so let's, uh, um, let's imagine, um, what's the next one? Sorry. Yes, so to make it concrete, Let's imagine A, you're familiar with the deck of cards, there are black cards and there's red cards, there's, uh, here they are, there's all sorts of numbers. And the idea is that let's imagine A stands for probability of an ace. Here are the aces, and the black card is all the black. Let's call that B, just to illustrate. So the probability of getting uh, um, A and B, meaning getting an ace and a black card, right? An ace and a black card is these two. Right? That's the only two uh, elements of this set that will actually uh, fulfill that requirement. So let's look at it in terms of conditional probability. What's the probability of getting an ace given that it's a black card? Right? It's all black cards. What's the probability of getting an ace? The answer is two aces and the, the total is 52 cards, but the, all the black cards are 26. So the probability of two chances are 26. Okay. What's the probability, probability of getting a black card? Well, half of the black cards, 26 out of 52, one half. So if we multiply those together, we get 2 and 52, which of course is the probability of getting two aces and a black card. Oh, sorry, getting an ace and a black card. All right? So I'm just showing that. It's not, it's not maths, really. It's just arithmetic. OK, so that's conditional probability, probably A and B. <coughs> Of course, probably A and B, it makes logical sense to us that that should be the same as the probability of 
DNA. So let's go. DNA. I'll just remind you what the technical terms looks like. So now the probability of BNA is given by the probability of B given A times the probability of A. Okay. Same condition plot formula. So let's look at this one. The probability of getting a black card uh, given that it's an X. So here's all the aces. What's the probability of getting a black card? Is two chances out of four. What's the probability of getting an ace? Uh, there are four aces in the whole deck, so that's one chance in 30. Okay? Multiply those together, and we get 2 out of 52, the same as before. So it worked. And of course it worked. It has to work. But I just want to demonstrate to you. But here's the, here's, here's the key to all the dilemmas of statistical hypothesis. You will notice the probability of A given B is not the same as the probability of B given A. Right. Probably getting an A given as a black card is 2 out of 26. Probably getting a black card given as an ace uh, is 2 out of 26. They're not the same. Come back to that. Right. Bayes, the Reverend Bayes, spotted back in 17 something or other, but was too scared to publish it probably, that hey, these two things are equal. Therefore, that means therefore, the probability of A given B times probability of B is equal to the probability of, uh, of B given A times the probability of A. Right? It's just the two right hand sides must be equal. It's not that taxing, is it? So if we divide through by the probability of B, we end up the probability of A given B, given the probability of B given A times probability of A, divided by the probability of B. And that is Bayes' rule. That's it. Nothing mysterious. There really is nothing odd about it. And so, if I want to know, uh, and this is also called, called the inverse probability question. Which is okay, everyone happy with that? Do you remember it? If you didn't remember it, you, did, you can see where it comes from. There's nothing really missing. Now, in Bayesian statistics and etc., these things are given names, which really helps to confuse everyone. This is called the posterior probability, this is called the likelihood, this is called prior, and that sometimes doesn't get a name at all, but sometimes called the marginal evidence. This will make sense in a moment. But that's just words. They're just words. Semantics, if you like. This is math. This is a truism. There's nothing. It's true. Given you know, the probability. So, now, that's just where it gets exciting. Let's call A and B not of uh, you know, subsets of carbon and dead die. But let's call a, a hypothesis of the state of the world. Okay? That you want to aliens are clear. And let's call a B, we'll call it E, meaning experimental evidence. You do an experiment, you get some evidence. Okay? So we can reconstruct the whole Bayesian rule into this new framework. But the probability of a hypothesis being true, given you've got this experimental evidence, is equal to the probability of evidence given your hypothesis times the probability of that hypothesis being true in the first place, divided by something else, this, this kind of constant probability of getting that evidence. Now this is where things happen. So let's take this go, we'll go back to the cards for a moment. Let's imagine your hypothesis. I give you a card. Uh, the probability of the evidence is, is um, 
half, if you work that out, one of these is two out of 26, one chance of 30. But you already know that. Now, now that sounds really right, absolutely fine, it's totally correct, except for one slight hiccup. Let's look at that deck and tell me if you think it's a fair deck.
justified by this, but we're not going to talk about it in And we end up with two, uh, these two probabilities of the hypothesis. You with me at the moment still? So what I'm trying to really get through your head is, when you do an experiment, you measure, you get evidence, and you work out the evidence given the hypothesis. What you really want to know is what's the probability of the real world being the state it is, given you've got your evidence. And that's the problem. And we work this out. This is messier. But basically, we're just saying what the probability of the evidence is. But don't worry about it. That's there. And we can ask questions later. But now, let's take an example. We'll take a medical example. Let's talk about cancer. Um, I don't know how, these are rough numbers, but 1% of women over the age of 40 get breast cancer. Right? That's our prime. We think it's true. It may not be exactly true, but we have strong belief in that. Through humongous amounts of data collection over the years. But it's still prime. 80% of women with breast cancer, I'm talking about over 40 now, are with breast cancer and a positive mammography. 10% okay. of women without breast cancer also have a positive mammography. So we can go down to that big caravan by the uh, and you have your test done, and that's pretty much what happens. So, now it's you. You go in, into, into the, uh, have a test, you see a doctor, he says, go and have a mammography, you go and have a mammography, and it's you, that you and you test positive. Some of you don't want to hear it. So what's the problem that you have with breast cancer? Well, there's no way of knowing the intuition doesn't help you in the frame. So you need to look at uh, Bayes' rule. So here we go again. So the possibility, we're saying H1 is the problem, is your hypothesis. You have breast cancer. And probably you have the breast cancer given the evidence, given a positive mammography. Is equal to the probability of getting a positive mammography given that you have cancer times the probability of you having cancer in the first place before you have the test. You can't like this, I don't know. And you can work it out. So the probability of, 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 uh, of, of, the, of having a positive mammography given that you have cancer is 80%, right? The probability of you having breast cancer in the first place to your prior, we reckon, is 1%. Point uh, the probability of the, of the evidence in the first place, um, we can work it out, it's 0.11. So to find that, put that into, into, uh, into base rule, and we end up with this important result. The probability of you having cancer, given you've got a positive demography, is only 0.08. The probability you don't, given you had a positive demography, is 0.92. Totally non-intuitive. I should say most medics don't get this. Um, and so you have a 1% chance before you went into your uh, mammography, now you have an 80% chance you come out. So it's quite unsettling, isn't it? Um, and the reason is because of all these, they're all complications. Part of it's because of it's only 80% accurate in the first place, and partly because of the false positive. You work it all out, uh, you end up with that situation. There's an eightfold increase in your probability. So, and this really happens. I mean, this really happens in real life. You have that positive test, you have a GP, you have a blood test, it comes out positive, and he says you've got to get you know, the derivative of the same. And, and you're absolutely panic stricken. Well, you should be worried, of course. <laughs> but just bear in mind, you depends how good your GP is, or how good the blood test is, how specific it is. Well, most tests are not that specific. Now, of course, there are two angles. There's one angle is that uh, that's not a huge increase in odds. But um, on the other hand, I think how much money is being spent on working this out. It's quite a lot. So, um, and, and as you know, I also have a, I work in a hospital too. Um, in a secondary or tertiary referral, where you get patients referred from other GPs, you end up, you can see the problem. I'm saying they only have limited either experience or knowledge or, or tests. They end up, we end up with this big asymmetry here. So from the, from basically 92% of your patients don't have the condition. Only 8%. That's important to get those 8%. But 
think of the amount of time I spent looking at applications for a normal. Now, it's a bit more complicated than that because there are other things you can get besides uh, cancer. But you get the idea, the non-intuitive nature of, of Bayesian reasoning. Now, we don't like probabilities, but we, we're pretty good with frequencies. So let's just recast the problem of frequency with an NR answer. So we know that, let's imagine we have 100 women over the edge of 40, and we test them. Okay. One of them is going to have breast cancer. 99 will have no risk, but we don't know. Uh, those are test positive uh, of these, but 80 percent of them will, and 20 percent won't, or 0.2. Uh, so 0.8 of this person will, excuse me, and 0.2 will be negative. For those that don't have breast cancer, even though the probability is uh, only 10 percent of a false positive, that translates to a lot of people. 9.9. Those who don't, 89.1. So, so the problem is, as the next person along the clinical chain, you don't know those very much. You have no way of knowing. So you've got 9.9 .9 people who don't actually end up having it, and 0.8 person that does. Right? Does that make sense now? The frequency going on? So that's the frequency approach. Um, and you know, there's been loads of tests on this, and most clinicians get it completely wrong. And I try to explain it to medical students, they still don't get it. But it's so important, to see. so you see how things work. And AIDS has been used, you know, now it's being used everywhere. It was actually used to track the amygdala code, it's been used to hunt down in submarines, it's been uh, used to track airplanes that crashed, all sorts of things. So it's a very, it's, a, it's not emerging, it's been around for ages, but it's becoming more dominant. And of course, no one likes prize. And one person in particular didn't like it. It was fish. So I'm going to, this is going to talk to you about fish. Yes. So I would like to introduce Sir Robert Fisher to you, who's one of the most eminent statisticians of this century, actually. And he reformed statistics in many scientific domains. And actually, Fisher thought of himself as being a non major These are his probably most important books, um, Statistical Methods for Research Workers and the Design of Experiments. The first book, which was published in 1925, was mostly concerned with agricultural issues, because after the First World War, there was a lot of food shortage in the UK. So he was really interested in optimizing the payoff different methods when it comes to agriculture. The second book, which he published 10 years later, is more concerned with general issues of statistical modeling. And he is actually the founder of the modern method of random sampling. And he is used all over the place in biomedical science, <coughs> psychology, and so on. And like I said, Fisher said, I'm not a Bayesian. Basically, in the design, he um, gave props to Bayes that he didn't publish his paper was published post mortem the as you heard, and um, he was really against this subjective approach of reasoning, and he tried to avoid prior probabilities, which might be very subjective actually. But when you actually read his books, you find that implicitly he uses a lot of Bayesian reasoning in order to justify his own thinking. So, for example, he talks about degrees of belief when it comes to rejecting, rejecting the null hypothesis. So when we reject the null hypothesis, this influences our degree of belief. So this is strong Bayesian talk, basically. So he's very controversial within himself when it comes to Bayesian reasoning. Um, and let me introduce shortly what Fisherian null hypothesis testing actually is. What you do is you set up a statistical null hypothesis, and the null hypothesis doesn't mean that there are zero differences between the groups. Most people think that the null hypothesis actually means that you postulate that there is equality between means or whatever, but the null hypothesis can also be a difference between groups. It just means you try to nullify it. This is actually something which is often wrongly complained in many statistics textbooks. So for me, it was also new to find out that the null hypothesis can actually be a different in population means. 
So what you try to do is you reject the null hypothesis by setting up a critical criterion. And um, this is the logic of hypothesis testing according to Fisher. You don't set up an alternative hypothesis um, and you just come up with one distribution. How did Fisher actually come up with this idea? And there is this famous experiment which he describes in the design of experiments, his first book, his second book, sorry, um, where he talks about the underlying logic of hypothesis testing. And that's the famous, the lady testing T experiment. And there have been even books have even been written about that. The young key was in bed, 90 The weather could not be more perfect for IT on the terrace. We gathered at the table as a friendly group of colleagues. The gathering had been progressing in a lively fashion, and the teacups were being refreshed when Lady Otterline abruptly stopped the server and pointed out with disdain that he had poured milk first and then tea, rather than abiding by a widely known preference for tea first and then milk. Sidelong glances were exchanged by numerous members of the central group as they questioned what difference could it possibly make whether milk or tea were poured first in the cup. It made, according to Lady Ogline, all the difference, a difference she could easily taste. It was at this point that I, as a scientist, and amateur detective decided to step in and propose a little experiment. Safely away from Lady Otterline's line of vision, eight cups of tea were prepared. Four cups with tea poured first, and four with milk poured first, always in equal proportions. Happily, Lady Otterline sent each of the eight cups and provided the crowd with her judgment of tea or milk first. Remarkably, Lady Otterline identified eight of eight correctly. Could such a feat be accomplished by sheer guesswork? <coughs> now, as I mentioned, I'm a scientist and I'm all. As such, I met this little party with more than just some papers. Indeed, I took with me much food from thought. Try my experiment yourself. Consider all the possible results. In what order should your cups be presented? How many cups must be correctly identified to conclude that your subject can truly tell the difference? You will undoubtedly come away with a great understanding of differential statistics. So this nicely illustrates the underlying logic of inferential statistics, how you actually draw a conclusion from your data. And you can think about this um, illustration or example yourself and you will find out how difficult it actually is to come up with the generic answer to the question basically. Okay, so why is why do we use five percent significance level? And nowadays if you want to publish a paper or just if you do research, the first thing you do in your ANOVA table or whatever you look for the for the five percent P value basically. And it's actually quite unclear why we use 5% as a significance level. It's basically an arbitrary level of significance. And Fisher contradicts himself in his writings, which is actually quite interesting in itself. So for example, in the design he writes, it's usual and, usual and convenient for experimenters to take 5% as a standard level of significance in the sense that they are prepared to ignore all results which fall out of this standard or which don't reach the standard. So, Actually, a non-significant result, according to Fisher, tells you nothing. So you just go home, you reject it, it means nothing to you. But later on he says, no scientific worker ever has a fixed level of significance at, at which from year to year and in all circumstances he rejects hypotheses. He rather gives his mind to each particular case in the light of his evidence and his ideas. So there you see that he is actually quite inconsistent himself and later on he becomes much more flexible when it comes to the definition of the significance level and that's quite interesting from my point of view. Um, however, Fisher was not the only one who contributed to the modern development of not hypothesis 
testing. And actually, textbooks, for the most part, don't talk about the other contributor, contributors. Um, and I give over to Chris, who will introduce Naaman and Pearson to you, who are at least as important as Fisher, but are not mentioned at all. Naaman and Pearson. You've heard of Pearson because of Pearson's correlation coverage. You've heard of Fisher because of his answers and transformation, etc. Uh, I've never heard of Naaman. But these two um, weren't happy with Fisher. So, so, so Fisher, so that, what Chris has told you as well, so that's where point 0.05 comes from. Right? So all the publications ever published in general psychology and medicine, all because of this ritual of point 0.05. No reason for it. Fisher wasn't that keen on fixing it anyway, but that's what we do. But anyway, so Naaman Pearson said, hey, we don't like Fisher's article, because what Fisher said, there's a, there's a null hypothesis, and your idea is to reject it. That's it. End of story. Naaman Pearson said, let's introduce an alternative called H1. It's all look familiar to some of you, imagine. And so what they said was, here's an H0, a null hypothesis, a bit like Fisher's hypothesis. And H1 is our alternative. So, it is not creative, it is not creative. In a particular kind of way, that's the point. So, um, um, as you can see, then, this is probably this is a normal distribution, but it doesn't have to be normal, it can be F distribution or T or whatever. And the idea is that now you introduce a whole new rich set of probabilities that you can look into. And so, so let's just go back in there, sorry. So clearly there's an overlap, and that's the condition. So sometimes uh, you think your null hypothesis really could have been the alternative, or vice versa. Um, if it doesn't overlap, you're in a really lucky situation, but it doesn't happen very well. And basically the idea is you could, uh, you could do an experiment and you have to decide which distribution does it belong to. So it's way out here, you're pretty confident the alternative is true, way down here, you're pretty confident, not perfectly confident, but very confident that the null is true. But as nature is the way it is, it ends up somewhere in the middle, and you could be right or you could be wrong. Right? So there are four outcomes. So let's imagine the state of the world really is. They're not correct. They really are correct. Right? Right. So <coughs> we'll say the world. Yes, yeah, so that's right. So they are they are correct. I mean the null is it. And you do an experiment, and you have to make a decision. Now, Fisher didn't really, although he was later on construed to make decisions, it's really Naaman and Pearson decided to make decisions. And, and by basically, there are these four possibilities. So you could reject the null hypothesis, uh, well, sorry, you could, you could accept the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true, they're not creative, we did an experiment, show they're not creative. And so that's correct. That's what we like. It could be that when we reject the null hypothesis, when it is the null incorrect, we reject the null correctly, and that's uh, again we'd like to do that. Right. But we can make these errors, which you're, you if you don't, you, this will remind you if you don't, if you don't show them. So we can reject the null hypothesis when in fact it really was true. So we say actually they are creative, but they're not. <coughs> And that will be a type 1 error. It's an error. Or we can do the other problem is we can actually accept the null hypothesis that they're not created when in fact they are. And that's a type 2 error. All right? Are you familiar with that now? Something like that. And, and we call this alpha and we call this beta. Just to make it more complicated, if we reject the null hypothesis correctly, that's called that's one, 1 minus this probability. We also call that power. It tells us how good our test is. Before Naaman Pearson, these concepts <coughs> did not exist. After them, they did exist, big time. And so I'm just going to take it through this. If you know this, try not to switch off, but you know, that is graphic. Pictures speak a million words. Like so here's Fisher area kind of situation. Here's a null hypothesis. We assume our null is the so z score is zero. Um, assume it's zero. And if you do an experiment and you find that your result falls into these tails, 
probability of alpha or 0.05, then you reject the null hypothesis. So are you going to be correct all the time? Well, of course not. 5% of the time you're going to be incorrect and you have a time on error. Alright? And that's all. Cool. You can have two tails, one tail, so don't worry about that for the moment. Alright? So that's and if it doesn't, if it falls out there outside here, <coughs> taking a Fisherian point of view, it just means your null's not probably not correct. But it could be any old time. Right? If you have one of Comes to name Pearson though, if it thought then it it could belong to this alternative. So here's, here's your mean of h0, or say h0, here's our alternative, or our alternative. Let's say it's mean of, in this case, 1, and z score of 1, and to this one. We assume it's the same, just you don't need to do all this, but it's just easy to see. So the probability that you would uh, reject the null hypothesis correctly, well, you've got to reject the null hypothesis, it's got to be minus 10 in here, and it's going to be the probability that's going to fall under the alternative distribution. So the purple is the probability of rejecting the correct right? And that's called power, or one minus one. Still with me? Right? If, you, uh, if you accept the null hypothesis under the green, even though it is really alternative is true, this is, this is blue color, beta. And in this particular scenario, beta is very high, much higher than, than alpha, and power is quite low. Okay? So now suddenly, by making that invention, I mean, well, it like that. by introducing the concept of a, an H1 alternative hypothesis, which is specific, you have to specify it, you suddenly introduce this whole new idea of type 2 errors and power. Now, and, there we go, sorry. And the other, and, and you, can, you can see intuitively that if this, the whole thing is this, it's the difference between the two, the two hypotheses that's important. But it's not just the difference, it depends on the standard deviation of the spread of these two distributions. So that introduces a whole new concept that no one had ever thought of before called effect size, which is the obsession of most psychology researchers. It's the difference between the means divided by the standard deviation, which is the poor variant of Dover. And because it's your sample, it depends on the sample size. So it's divided by, that should be divided by square root n. Sorry, that's a time for And so that means that the more sample size, the more people I select for my experiment, the smaller the standard errors of the mean. That means that distributions get separated. It means I have much higher probability of getting power. But I'll show you. So let's imagine here's a next sign. One standard deviation. Uh, that's purple is your power. Um, the red bit, alpha, we keep in contact for a moment. And then we change that. Let's imagine we, we increase the effect size in terms of standard deviation. Now suddenly our power is gone up. Got it? So we're more likely to reject the null hypothesis correctly. And now probably to make an incorrect rejection is still up. What is that like? Okay, so that's pretty important if you want to do a better experiment. And one way to do that is to have more people. But the other thing, of course, is that it also <coughs> depends on alpha. So here's back to this original situation. Uh, we've got a small uh, effect size here. Here's alpha is 0.05, two tails. Here's our power. They're very close together, so you have low power. Let's change out features as we can. We should, but we don't. We stick to it. But let's imagine we did what would happen. Let's increase our to the, uh, a much bigger thing. Suddenly, what happens is, we go back, so I should have to put here. Look at the purple. The purple goes up, uh, and now uh, we, get more, we get more power. Um, we we'll actually get less power. That's not quite good. That and the point I'm trying to make is what Newman and Pearson decided to do was that what we're going to do is we're going to fix, we've decided this, thing and this, and we're going to fix alpha to some value, and then we're going to maximize the possibility of rejecting the non hypothesis correctly, to maximize power. You can't do both, so you have to fix one. Now, I know this sounds all convoluted, but there are many alternative ways of doing it. But they chose this particular uh, way of doing it. And 
and we've been living with it ever since. And so, and that, and, and they actually, they said you could change alpha if you wanted to. But somehow or other, it got transferred, fixed into, into history that you keep alpha fixed. And, they, and, and that you must fix it before you do the experiment. You all know that, you must set up your alpha and then do your experiment. And then, and, and then uh, reject the no, we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not. Now, what they did, uh, so, now the important point here, which sometimes people forget, is actually the two things. One is that you've got to generate this alternative, and if you put in for a grant in the medical, you've got to, in a medical grant, for example, you've got to state what your power is, which means you've got to know what your alternative is. Which sometimes you do, but quite often you don't. Um, and, and the idea was that, uh, so they basically said that if, if, you, if, you, if you accept the hypothesis, does not mean that you believe in it, they say, um, but you act as if it's true. Um, I'm not sure that's <laughs> become, um, it becomes truth, I think, really. And, and, and of course, it's limited to having these two hypotheses. But the real point is that it's not Bayesian. There's no prize at any of this. There's no prize in Fisher, there's no prize in Naval. If there's no prize, it's not Bayesian. So, this led to some controversy. So, so, but the point, before we move on, the point is, at this point, they published this in 1933. From then on, all the sciences, particularly psychology and medicine, and that became very attracted by this idea. And it became the only way you could publish. And still is. This is an optimal choice given that you fix alpha. Yeah, but what I mean is you could change alpha. Yes, you could. Yeah. And, there, and there are other theories completely different, right. based on the signal detection theory, for example, okay. which in Sweat's books, for example, where you can actually, you can just alpha and beta according to <coughs> optimize your payoff. So they're assuming that it is optimal in one sense, but it's basically assuming that uh, alpha is fixed for that experiment. And the answer is why. So for those who don't, if you do signal detection theory, you can play your bank with every both of them. And that's pretty pretty well established. But but the real point is of course that it's not it's not basic and not always signal detection. Yeah to follow up on Sue's question actually um, in the name Pearson framework you can actually define the probability of committing a type 1 or type 2 error that is a false alarm or a false positive because imagine you're in a hospital and you want to detect the cancer you might not want to miss the cancer but you might want to have a lot of false alarms but in other situations you might be willing to accept a much higher number of false alarms so you can play around with these parameters depending on the issue and not in some fixed institutionalized ritualistic way basically is what we are doing at the moment and we come back to this right now actually because there was a fierce intellectual competition going on between Neyman and Pearson. They really couldn't stand each other and there was intellectual boxing um, going on to some degree but one thing is for sure, both camps agreed on one thing that you shouldn't draw mechanized statistical infer inferences from your data. So they had a lot of disagreement Define an alternative or not. So in, Pierce, in Fisher's view, there was no alternative hypothesis. In the name of Fisher's view, there was an alternative hypothesis, playing around with parameters or not. But both said, don't do it in a mechanic, mechanistic way. So um, what I just said, that there is a null and an alternative hypothesis, leads actually to a very interesting point when you think about it, which is symmetry and asymmetry between hypotheses. So in the Fischerian um, theory, you just, just have your null hypothesis and you try to reject it. So let's say you reject your null hypothesis. Does that actually give you evidence for any of the other competing hypotheses which are out there? Because you haven't specified an alternative hypothesis. 
So you reject another hypothesis, which, but there is no way to tell which of the other competing hypotheses might actually be true. So it's asymmetric from that point of view, because you can only reject HR, but you cannot conclude anything about the real world otherwise. In the name Personian framework, you specifically define the parameters of the alternative hypothesis. hypothesis. You can actually have many competing hypotheses, but we just for simplification talk about one alternative. And when you reject your null hypothesis in the name and Pisonian framework, this actually gives you evidence for the competing hypotheses. So there is symmetry from that point of view. So you can conclude nothing from a non-significant result when it comes to Fisher, but you actually gain knowledge by rejecting the null when you follow the name and Pisonian account. Um, but what's quite interesting is actually that the conflicts between both parties are completely <coughs> hidden. So none of the textbooks actually, like I already said, mention Naaman and Pearson. And if they do, only in the context of some tables and the copyright they asked for or something like that. But from our point of view, the denial of parents, because these parties are the parents of our modern hybrid ritual of <coughs> hypothesis testing, is part of the game, because if people would become aware of the controversy between them, people would become aware of the statistical issues associated with both points of view, and then they would actually see that there is no one way of doing research following one mechanistic procedure. Like I said, none of them would actually agree on the way we are doing hypothesis testing today because the way we are doing hypothesis testing today is actually a hybrid theory. And it has been stated by famous statisticians that it's a mishmash of Fischerian and name and Pisonian methods. And this mishmash is actually topped um, with some Bayesian interpretations, which actually don't fit into the framework at all. So what I would like to talk about is this offspring theory of the competing camps, which we will call the hybrid, or we can also call it the non-ritual, because this hybrid theory is used in a social context, and in a very ritualistic way, and actually psychology should investigate rituals, but not use them by themselves, actually. So this is Cohen, this is very recommended paper, <laughs> the earth is wrong, he's more, so, um, so the hybrid, what are we doing today? What we are doing today has actually not much to do with the different hypotheses that both camps uh, formulated. What we are doing is set up only one hypothesis, use 5% as a convention, and report results as p smaller than, and you round up to the next number, which actually is you. Sometimes you see the exact p value reported, but for the large majority of publications, you see significance reported in this way. Then we make yes or no decisions based on the outcome of our significance <coughs> testing. This is congruent with the name and Pisonian framework, but we don't specify alpha, we don't talk about um, statistical power, which is another topic of relevance that researchers should actually um, do power analysis before they conduct research. But that left aside, the ritualistic point is always perform this procedure. So it's like um, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. We repeat the same procedure all over again for all different problems without thinking about the variability and the problems we are interested in. So, some criticism from very famous people. So it's not our point. This has been stated before by, for example, the former president of the American Psychological Association, Paul Neal, who's a brilliant clinical psychologist and he was deeply involved in philosophical issues or in the philosophy of science. So he suggested that Fisher has mesmerized and befuddled us and led us down the primrose path, and he thinks that it's the worst thing that ever happened in the history of, of psychology. And Jacob Cohen argues not only. Um, does significance testing fail to support the advance of psychology as a science, but it also has seriously impeded its progress. So we should take these people seriously because 
Um, they have been thinking about these issues for quite some time. My nice animation isn't working. Um, Gerd Gigerwenzer puts it very nicely for Max Planck Institute in Berlin. This is the last quote I will read to you, but it's really um, informative. Few researchers are aware that their own heroes rejected what they practiced routinely. For example, if you think about Pavlov or Piaget or Müller, you wouldn't catch them calculating a p-value or anything. Or Skinner, they were all opposed to these methods, especially Skinner actually. He opened up his own journal in order to be able to publish his data without reporting significant values. So awareness of the origins of the ritual, that is the null ritual, and of its rejection could cause a violent cognitive dissonance and in addition to dissonance with editors, reviewers and dear colleagues. Suppression of conflicts and contradicting information is at the very nature of this social ritual. Um, and I actually agree with Eva Wenzel. From my experience, this is exactly what's going on at the moment. It's a social ritual. Um, Short summary, what's wrong with null hypothesis testing? It doesn't tell us what we want to know. So all the mathematician, mathematics Chris was explaining so neatly actually boils down to one simple point. We are interested in the probability of the null hypothesis being true or false. Okay? We can't be interested in the truth or falsehood of the alternative hypothesis because we haven't set it up, you know what I mean? Otherwise, we would be interested in the alternative hypothesis, actually. But let's stick to the way we're doing it. We're interested in the probability that a null hypothesis is true or false. But what the significance test gives us is simply the probability of obtaining the data given that the null hypothesis is true. And not the inverse probability, the Bayesian posterior, which would be the probability of the hypothesis given the data being true. So we are actually making a very bad logical mistake by thinking about the direct probability as being the inverse probability. Um, and these two statements are not the same as has been pointed out over many years, but still people, when you hear them talk about their research results or when you read papers, they implicitly and sometimes explicitly conclude that by rejecting the null, they found evidence for their hypothesis. This is the worst mistake you can make. But even if you reject the null hypothesis, it does not even tell you about the probability of the null hypothesis being true or false. The only thing it gives you, and we would like to stress this point, is you get the probability of the data given that the null hypothesis is true, which is not the same as its inverse. So, let's go to the small experiment we made, because I think we will find a lot of these fallacies, like inverse probability, wishful Bayesian thinking, back in the data. And I hope this works, so I quickly try to analyze the data in real time. So, these are our results. And actually, all statements are false. <laughs> okay, so we can see that a lot of people actually answer questions as true. And I will just give me a second and I will give some more concrete. <coughs> so let's see how many people actually got it right and said all statements are false. These are six people. Um, no, it's just one person, which is 6% of the total. So of the whole group, 1% got it right. And let's leave it with that, actually. What we could do, we could look into the individualistic, in the, into the individual questions, but it doesn't make much sense out of time readers, I think, as well. So the point is, um, we are definitely not the only ones who are committing these logical fallacies. And I would like to point them out because it's really um, um, yeah, insight for to understand why people get it wrong. We call the p-value as the probability of the observed data given that the null hypothesis is true, defined in symbols as p 
states are given in H0. Statement 1 and 3 are easily detected as formal fallacies. So let's look at statement 1 and 3. You have absolutely disproved in 1 and you have absolutely disproved in 3. We can be sure that actually you cannot ever disprove anything with absolute certainty because we're dealing with probabilities. But people who actually um, say this statement is right, they would commit the illusion or fall prey to the illusion of certainty because they would actually not get the concept of probability, right? So the next um, thing is statement two and four are also false. And this actually uh, comes back to the inverse probability issue. So the probability of the data given H0 is not the same thing as the probability of H0 given the data. Let's look at statement two and four for just a second. You have found the probability of the null hypothesis being true. You didn't, you don't know anything about the probability of the null hypothesis being true or false. The only thing you know is the probability of the data given the null hypothesis. And the same is true for four as well. So this is basically the problem of inverse probability. And just for reasons of completeness, let's go, let's skip statement five. Statement six is the most interesting one. You have the replicable experimental finding. This is called the replication fallacy. So many people think that their p-value actually tells them something about the probability that you, when you repeat your research, that you find the same findings. But from a logical point of view, the null hypothesis test doesn't tell you anything about that. Um, the probability of your date that you think the data given H0 is true tells you nothing about the probability of replication. So it's, again, a complete misinterpretation which you find very often when you talk to people interpreting P values. So people in very high positions get it wrong, actually. For example, I don't follow that one. Ah, from, sorry? I don't follow that one. So basically what, what it means is many people think that the p-value tells you something about the replicability of yeah. your research, but the p-value tells you nothing about the probability. So you've got a hypothesis, and you've got a probability of generating that data. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that, the probability of generating that data, let's assume that's correct. Why, if you repeat it, why you generate the same probability of generating that data? One minute time to error first. And actually, two. Like I want to point out, the, the editor of the Journal of Experimental Psychology, which, which is one of the top journals, quotes ex explicitly that papers, that he uses a level of significance as a measure of confidence that the result of the experiment would be repeatable under the conditions described. And he published that. And he has been the editor, chief editor for 13 years. So at the highest ranks uh, of, in the psychology hierarchy, people actually fall prey to this fallacy. And even worse, textbooks which teach that stuff to students get it wrong as well. For example, for example Nunnally says, if the statistical significance is at the 0.5, 0.05 level, the investigator can be confident with odds of 95 out of 100 that the observed difference will hold up in future investigations. So even in textbooks you find this, these illusions back, which is quite disturbing from my point of view. So these are perpetuating statistical illusions. And we were just talking about the inverse probability the, uh, uh, problem, which is, in my opinion, or in our opinion, the most important point of the whole talk to understand that it only gives you the probability of the data given H0, not the inverse. But even this is explained completely wrong in some of the most sold textbooks. So, for example, in Guilford's hands, the P value miraculously turns into a Bayesian posterior probability. He says, if the result comes out one way, the hypothesis is probably correct. If it comes out the other way, the hypothesis is probably wrong, which is logically completely invalid. But this textbook has been sold to many statistics teachers. They teach their knowledge to their students. And so we got this cross-generational meme floating um, around. So the study we just did together has been conducted before with German 
professors, some of them teaching statistics. So students all get it wrong. Okay, all of them check votes, check more than one statement as being true. But when you look at professors not lecturing statistics, 90% get it wrong. And professors lecturing statistics, 80% of them get it wrong. And actually, these German professors slightly outperformed the British professors. I didn't put the stats on there. <laughs> but, but still, these are very high effects um, when it comes to misinterpretation. So we already talked about that. The inverse probability is just not in there. This is Bayesian reasoning and not Fisherian or Pearson uh, or native Bessonian reasoning, okay? Um, right? It's wishful Bayesian thinking, basically. Really, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a belief, and it's the belief that the significance, say, is the probability that another hypothesis is correct. We already discussed that. I got, just got the signal that I have to hurry up a little bit, so I will skip through this. And just to make one point, we think these are necessary illusions, actually, because if people would understand the underlying logic, they wouldn't use not hypothesis testing, because it doesn't tell you anything about what you're really interested in. What you're really interested in is it's the probability of your hypothesis being true and not giving some data. I hope, yeah, we are exactly at the right point. Give it over to Chris for validation, right? Right. You think you get the idea? Chris, this is my part, just a very <laughs> short one. So, two All seconds, right. and you give me on in a, a parable concerning editorial policy. Sorry for that. So, if this works, which it doesn't. <laughs> Projects are being marked. 20,000. 
How many of those are going to be false positives? Anyone do this? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, their supervisor goes and publishes all this. So it's a ph phenomenal number of false positives have been produced. Okay? You can't stop it. Uh, but then you. Okay. And then you, of course, go and see this published paper and you think, oh, I'm going to do that experiment. I'm going to replicate it or work on that idea. And suddenly, these 45 false positives spawn a whole <laughs> for years to come and careers are made on Because those false positives will ensure other false positives. And if you don't replicate it, you don't publish it. <coughs> so the this projection. So it's all because of hypothesis testing. So, so it, it, to be all honest, you think, well, okay, you're going to say, well, what else could we do? Um, there are other things you can do, and I'm going to try and, I'm not going to go into there's lots of possibilities. I've already told you last time, you know, perhaps you just don't want to do hypothesis testing, but there are situations where you really do. Uh, we saw a very nice example yesterday with the data analysis that I just replicated here, where one view is don't use alpha 0.05, just publish the confidence intervals. It's quite popular, uh, and, and this is so you have a mean and confidence interval, but if it crosses zero, if you really must, you can still see the problem of being uh, rejected if you used your 0.05. But you can you get a much more clearer picture. And this, for anyone who's done other than psychology, this is how physics and chemistry and that have worked for years. You combine results, we call it uh, medicine, we call it meta-analysis, but meta-analysis has been around since the dawn of ages. You combine all people's results, and you can combine them this way. There are other ways of doing it, with Bayesian uh, uh, ways of doing it. So that's one thing you can do. So you can see, well, how confident are you about your aliens? You get a lot more information. Like, there's a number of, lots of other ways, but one that's becoming more popular is, is it's called phase factor. So back to phase. We can actually, if you've got two, if you must have two hypotheses, you can compare them by taking the ratios of their uh, of their posterior probabilities, and and that way you, you, you might notice that P of E is gone there. Uh, and so a lot of people are focused on phase factor. So you can measure that's it. Probability of getting in data a given hypothesis one divided by the probability of getting data a given hypothesis zero. Take the ratio, that's your base. You still need priors, but there are ways around that which I'm not going to, but you can you can ignore them if you think the recall, or you can actually make some judgments on that. But the point is, this allows you to test your null hypothesis, which you couldn't do before. Bizarrely, it yeah, allows you to test your alternative, which you couldn't do before. Let me just make that point. You've done your experiment, you've got to do not. You've done, you've written a grant in the MRC or something. They, they said you need a power analysis. You set up your alternative. You've done your power analysis. I want 200 patients, you can do it. You do the whole study and you get a significant result or you don't. It's got nothing to do with what your alternative was. Change your alternative. Doesn't change the result, does it? So what the heck is the alternative doing? You're not testing that either. You're just testing. I'm twisted it up. Just all you're testing is the probability of getting the data given if if the null hypothesis is true. That's all you're doing. So the rest of it is just imagining. <laughs> so so that's the point. So if you do something like this, which is increasingly popular, uh, there are other things as well. You can actually. Um, you can actually actually put a number to the probability of your hypothesis given your data being true. So, <clears throat> as all things, it's artistic, right? So this reason is art. It's not. You cannot have an <coughs> institutional uh, ritual which we all go through. I go. Uh, I hate it. You know, uh, is it point? You know, you know what you do. Is it point? It's point to six. Well. <laughs> if I chuck out all those over seven, oh yeah, 0 0.052, uh, what else can we do? Check out the outliers, I know, get rid of the outliers. <laughs> Bingo, 0 0.049, publish. What a waste of time. It's not, because that's 
That's the institution you live in, and that means you get a paper published, you go on the ref, you get money, and the rest of the world and, and it ticks off, doesn't it? But what have we learned? Not much. So let's start thinking about how we think about hypothesis. My, my advice, unless you really have to do it, just don't do it. Right? Get your data to speak for itself. Get your aims to show everybody that they're creative. How do you do that? And he went to Thurston. to look at the previous experiments, you could use those to uh, give you an idea of the priors and use yeah. those. And that would be the way to do it because then you're incorporating all the previous data to answer your question. But we don't do it. Just that. I said, forget about your effect size, standardized. Think about the real effect of what it means. There is no answer. It's, you know, I can't give you a, a, a recipe. So right? maybe I mean, the best thing to do maybe is to look everything in a more contextual approach. I mean, because everything is changing. Even yeah. though we have some rules to regulate our statistical analysis, maybe it's changing from one context to one context. Well, and also, we are. I mean, the way we interpret effect size is even also subjective. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, the question is, when I teach my students, I say to them, you know, does it pass the so what test? Right? If it passes the so what test, meaning, actually, that's quite interesting. Uh, for everyone in this room, it's quite interesting if aliens are created. And you get some evidence that helps you understand that possibility. That's fine, but if you, if you go away from making a decision and say, look, I have this data that's, you know, and it's an interesting idea, um, you know, then do another experiment. Most, I don't, I'm trying to think of other areas like you know, physics out where you have a hypothesis. You don't have one. You estimate it. Yes, and you do build theories, but you don't build theories around 0.05. So it really depends on the context. I know there is no other answer, but that's science in my view. Yeah. It is partly creative, right? So you, put, yeah, it's the real effect that matters. Then yeah, we'll do. Well, that's clear as that. Yeah. Well, quite, there are some people in this in this department in, in this, who are also experts in, in non. Uh, in Bayesian uh, estimation, so it's not. But do think before you do 0.05. Uh, what's your goal? <laughs> Is it just to please an editor? You obviously don't. You, know, you don't know what you're talking about, basically. Okay. I have a jacket. Uh, but yeah, basically, it's just, you also have problem of dimensionality, so you have lots of hypotheses. Yeah. It's going to be impossible to have enough data to test it. Yeah, yeah. So you, have to, you do have to make some assumptions. 
Yeah, there's nothing wrong in making assumptions yeah. as long as you clear that what they are. Yeah. I mean, you know, a whole Bayesian is based on probability. Yeah. That's assuming yeah. you know, there's some assumptions there. But as long as you clear what they are, yeah. the problem is when you do these alpha. You get a prize or something. It is, everywhere is recognized. It, but it won't go away. It's reality. That's the point. It doesn't mean that it's not a problem. It's just that pretending it's not there, which is the standard thing, is the problem. And even Fisher talked about updating your degrees of relief. So he was dealing with clients as well, basically. So we all have certain assumptions about the world, and we want to update them in the light of new evidence. This is what gaining knowledge is all about. So there's no way around yeah. defining clients, actually. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's gaining knowledge, isn't it? That's what this is about. I don't know how you define knowledge, but it's not peak point of well, I hope that was, helps you think about the world anyway. Lunchtime, I hope, is it? Yes, that's all.